Hi everyone, Krista Cowan here with another episode of the Barefoot Genealogist. Today we are talking about how to request information from an archive. Um, an archive is going to be the, the loose term we'll use today for any kind of record repository. So that could be a state or county or local historical archive, it could be a library, it could be a vital records office, it could be um, just any kind of a record repository. I kind of use those two terms a little bit interchangeably. What we're going to cover today is um, why you might need to contact an archive uh, to request information. Uh, where you get the information to be able to contact them, where you find them, and then some specifics about how to request that information. And hopefully along the way I'll be able to provide you with some really specific examples for some of the most commonly requested uh, record types that we come across as we do family history research. So with that introduction, let's go ahead and dive straight in to our presentation. We're going to talk first about um, why we might need to order records from archives. So for those of you who've, uh, who are new to genealogy in particular, one of the things that I often hear from you is, well, isn't everything online? And of course, the answer to that is no, it's not. Um, everything is not online, and it likely never will be for a few reasons. Um, one is that some record repositories only make indexes available because they want you to come to them for the original record for a lot of reasons. Um, one of the main reasons is it's a source of revenue for them. These records that we use, birth, marriage, death records, census records, military records, none of these records were created for genealogists. They were all created for other purposes. And so these archives or record repositories don't have any kind of an obligation to us as genealogists. We use these records to learn more about our family history and to grow our family trees. But the, the people that hold these records have other priorities. And so if they can use what we do as a way for them to generate income so that they can continue to preserve uh, and collect records, then there are, many of them are going to do that. One of the prime examples of this, um, this scenario is the General Register's office in England. Uh, we talked about this on Tuesday just a little bit, but let me just um, remind you about that if you weren't here. The General Register's office in England has made their birth, marriage, and death indexes available to us. They start in 1837. They're excellent, excellent records, but it is only an index. Not only that, the index that they provide is very, very limited. So for example, if I'm looking for um, a David Smith who was married, you know, in Yorkshire sometime around 1837, I might have three or four that come up and I might not be certain which one it is. What their index provides me with is the quarter that the marriage was registered in, the registration district, now that's the registration district, not necessarily where the marriage took place, and then we infer the county from that. Then there's a volume and page number. And then it shows you everybody whose marriage was also registered on that same page. So if I know that my David Smith, for example, married a Hannah Crabtree, well then I know I have the right record. But if all I know is that he married a woman named Hannah, these names are common enough, I might not know this is the right person unless I actually order the certificate. And then when you order the certificate, and here's why you want to do this, those certificates provide more information. In the case of um, a marriage record from England, it will likely provide both the groom and the bride's father's names and occupations and residence, as well as the specific date and location of that marriage. So right now, like I said, we just have a quarter in which it was registered, but they could have been married on the 26th of June, right? Not even in July, August, or September. So ordering that actual certificate gives you more information in many, many cases. And, and like I said, in this case, they want you to order those records from them because it is a source of income or revenue for them. And so they make indexes available so that we can get close, um, but then we have to contact them for the additional information. 
Some record repositories are still in the process of digitizing records. A prime example of this is the National Archives of the United States, um, also known as NARA, or the National Archives and Records Administration. They um, have partnerships with several organizations to digitize records. They also digitize some of their own records, but the amount of holdings that they have means that it will take a really long time to digitize everything they have, even as, as much as they've invested in it. And the National Archives here in the United States is a fairly unique situation because they are investing a lot of time and resources into um, getting these records digitized either by themselves or by their partners. Other record repositories don't have that kind of time or manpower or financial resources to be able to do that and so they may be digitizing at a much slower rate and so in the meantime you know and we are and we we're talking decades here in some cases to be able to digitize all of this information in the meantime if you still want access to some of those records you either have to go there or you have to write to them for copies of their information and then one of the other reasons why uh, these information requests are necessary is that some record repositories may never digitize records or make them available online. And there are, again, several reasons for that. Um, many of those reasons are financial because they do not have the financial resources or the manpower to do it. Some of them are fear-based. Um, the Whoever is the um, the administration over that particular record repository may not know or feel comfortable with or want to put information online or make it available online. Some of it is legal. Uh, many countries and states and counties have privacy laws that prevent them from putting that information online, but they will still make it available to people in person or through written requests. Particularly in some states, Alabama comes to mind because I was just looking at it. Alabama has a 125 year privacy law on their birth records and their birth records started in 1908 at the state level. So um, what that means is that those records are not and will not be online for quite a while. However, they do make those birth certificates available if you are a relative of that person. So you can write to the state of Alabama and get a copy of a particular birth record. So this is why we have to do some of these offline or even um, web-based, form-based, email-based information requests because all the information that we need to be able to build our family trees and some of that information that may be causing you that brick wall um, is not going to be available uh, on a website like Ancestry.com and so we can get you close, we can help you find some, maybe some indexes to some of that information or know what's available, but um, you may still have to, likely will still have to, um, interact with some of these record repositories. So let's talk about where these record repositories are and how you find them. Um, the first thing I would encourage you to do is anytime you find an index record in particular, read the database description to discover where Ancestry.com obtained that index. So in the case of this particular England and Wales free BMD marriage index that I'm looking at here, if I scroll down past this record, past that save box, let me make this a little bigger for you, past this save box, what I'm going to see here is this database description and it includes source information. So it says that we obtained this record, the original data, from the General Register Office in England and Wales. So I could just come in here into Google and I could type in General Register Office of England, clearly I've done that before, and there it is, the GRO, and that will take me to their website and you can see here because they get this request a lot one of the very first links you're going to find here is order certificates online those certificates are going to cost you nine pound 25 including postage um, and they actually provide you with a form an online form to fill out to um, get that information you can also and ancestry.com provides you with this in many cases Look for a link over here somewhere on the left, in this case it's right here, where I can order that marriage certificate. That will provide you with a form where you can do it directly from here. Now it's gonna cost a little more um, because we have to have, have a processing fee, but one of the things we do is we fill in some of the information for you so that you don't have to try and copy and paste and hope you get it all accurate. So 
if you can order it directly from here or you can Google the name of the record repository um, from the source information and see if they have a way for you to order it online. Now another really popular index that gets used a lot on Ancestry.com is what we commonly refer to as the SSDI or the Social Security Death Index. That particular um, index is provided by the US government and it is just an index. It's actually the, the real, the official name of it is the master death file. It's, it was created to provide banks and credit card companies and insurance companies and the federal government with notice of who had passed away um, as a way to prevent fraud. So if they could just look it up and see if, if this social security number, um, if the name matches and if this person is deceased, well then of course they shouldn't be applying for a credit card or filing taxes. And so that was the purpose of this um, particular index. Remember, most all genealogical records that we use were not created for genealogical purposes. But what this does for us genealogically is it gets us to a place where we can discover um, how to order the original form that they used, that they filled out in order to get their social security card. So um, what it does is it's, it provides you with an, an, a form that the person themselves in most cases filled out Hopefully, and there's been some privacy restrictions around this, but very often, well, they always had to include their parents' names. Now, sometimes um, because of some new privacy laws and some new restrictions being placed, there, uh, those parents' names are sometimes blacked out on that application when you receive it, unless you can provide information that the parents are deceased. But it does just give you some further genealogical information. Right over here, again, in this left-hand side, you're going to see this link that says request copy of original application and I love when it works <laughs> um, and you can order a copy of what's um, of that application form that social security application form you can do the same thing again here in Google you can come in here and you can say you know what I want to contact the Social Security Administration and I want information about how to order um, the application that they filled out and so you can do it directly yourself just by googling that information again that information came from the source down here social security administration or you can use the links here to order copies of those records so always check those database descriptions to see where we got the index so that you know who to contact now, in some cases, we don't have any information online. So, for example, in, in I think Alabama is a good example. Alabama birth records, um, I don't think that we have any of them online after 1908 because of that 125-year privacy law. But you can still determine who holds those records. And there are a couple of places that you can do that. One is the Family History Wiki, and I'll show you in just a moment how to find that. And then the other are our state pages. So those are the two places that I always go to just check and see what's available. Let's start with that second one first. <clears throat> State pages are found by just clicking on search. Scroll down past the search box and you're going to see a map. And I can then click, I've got my screen maximized, there we go. And then I can click on any state and I can say I want to see what repositories or resources are available for this location. In this case, it's going to tell me that um, Alabama Vital Record registration began in 1908 and that the Alabama Department of Public Health and Vital Records are the ones who hold those records. It does tell me that birth and death records are closed for 125 years except to family, but that marriage and divorce records are publicly available. So I can click on this and it will take me to the Alabama Department of Public Health website. And then of course I want to look and, and sometimes the information that you want is just right in your face. They get these requests often enough that they put it right up front. Sometimes it's a little bit hidden and you have to kind of dig for it. In this case it's right here on the home page, this information about obtaining birth certificates. And it gives you some information about the fees, what the restrictions are, um, what information they need in order to locate the certificate. And then in this case, 
they actually provide you with a downloadable mail-in application that you can send directly to them for this cost of $15, or they provide you with a link to um, a service called Vital Check. Vital Check is a service that Ancestry.com also uses to order some of those certificates, but they do um, have an additional service fee. So that's just to make you aware, you can, you can order it directly online using Vital Check, or you can download a PDF application form and mail it yourself directly to the Alabama Vital Records Office. So if they provide um, information, uh, if they provide a form or an online information, look for that because that's going to be the easiest way to just fill that out and then you know exactly what they're looking for. That's the state pages and I can do that for any state. I just again click on that map, go to the resources tab and there are usually links here for in this case the Department of Vital Records. If I scroll down there's links to the Alabama Department of Archives and History. They have an, an extensive catalog online so I could go and see what kinds of records they have that might not be online. It, they'll, they'll provide descriptions of the records that they hold. Um, they won't provide name indexes so I can't search for my great-grandfather but I could see you know what if he was living in in Alabama in 1867 they have a list of voters Alabama voters so that's a record that I might be interested in obtaining a copy of. In this case there's um, several other the Alabama Historical Association the National Archives in Atlanta which holds regional records for the state of Alabama Public libraries, those are a great resource um, for genealogical records, newspapers, obituaries, maps, all sorts of things. So any one of those state pages is going to have a resource tab. That's what you're going to want to look for to see what other records might be available out there. The other place I mentioned is the Family History Wiki. You're going to find that by hovering over the Learning Center button, and it's going to be that bottom option down there, Family History Wiki. When I get there, I can just type in the name of a state, or I can type in the word vital and it will take me to vital records for that location. Again, it's just another way to get access to the links or the um, information about the repositories that hold the records. So um, explore those a little bit for the areas where your family is from and just see what exists. What other records exist out there that are not online that you might not yet have considered? Now, let's talk about in our last few minutes here how, because that's really the meat of what several of you requested here. Um, here's my first tip. I think I've already mentioned it. If they provide a form or if Ancestry.com provides a form, use it. That's going to ensure that you provide them with the information they need. It's usually got the cl really clear information about how much it's going to cost to order a copy of those records. And it's going to be your request is likely to be processed more efficiently and quicker. If they don't provide a form, look for an email or a mailing address. Oftentimes they will have that right up front on their website so that you can contact them um, or send them a request. Also, look, and sometimes you have to dig around for it a little bit on their websites, look for pricing information. If they provide pricing information, send payment with your request. That's why they've provided that pricing information. They will not process your request without the $10, $15, $25 that they need in order to do that research and provide you with those copies. If they don't provide pricing information or if you can't find it, you might want to give them a call if there's a phone number available and if you know they're not in another country or something to see if you can ask for that information, um, how much it would cost to do this kind of a search. Uh, if that's not possible, then just make sure you write into your little request that you are willing to pay for research and copies. I'll show you an example here of that um, in just a minute. Now, let's talk about records. So we've been talking about records that you know exist, right? You found an index and you know they have a copy of that birth record and so you're just trying to order a copy of that record. But what if you don't know if they have any records? What if you see that they have like that 1867 tax list in the state of Alabama? You know they have a collection of records that might have information about your family. So one of the things you want to do is check the online catalog. Most um, state archives for certain and national archives 
have really extensive online catalogs. As you start getting smaller, you know, local um, archives, um, public libraries, sometimes their catalogs aren't as extensive online, but sometimes they really are. And even in other countries, we find that their online catalogs tend to be, they're getting better because they don't want to be processing requests for, do you have this record or these kinds of records when they can just put that information out there. On Ancestry.com, we actually have a really terrific catalog that has been provided for Eastern European archives. So if your family is from, um, um, you know, any of the Eastern European countries, Russia, Ukraine, Belarus, Romania, um, any of those countries, you're going to find that this um, database has a lot of really great information. It is not a database that is going to come up if you do a name search. We, these, this is not an index of names. What it is, is an index of archives in Eastern Europe and what kinds of records they hold for certain time periods. The easiest way to find it is through the card catalog. Um, I always just type in Miriam's first name. Miriam Weiner is the woman who um, spent her entire career essentially um, creating this database of this catalog of holdings in Eastern European archives. You can see here the title of it is the Miriam Weiner Eastern European Archival Database. And if you scroll down to that database description, there's information there about how she created it, what countries are included, what types of archives, um, just a lot of really great information about doing research in those archives. But if you happen to know a specific location where your family is from, you can come in here and you can just type in the name of the place I'm going to mark that exact, and I'm going to go ahead and just click search. <clears throat> and you'll see here it comes up with, because I did a place search, not a name search, it comes up with a list of records that are available in the archives in Ukraine for this town or this province. So you can see they have birth records and censuses and death records and um, some Jewish specific records, marriage, divorce, tax lists. Um, Holocaust records, more censuses. So this is the kind of information that is available in some of these archives that has not yet or may never be digitized and put online. And so we have this catalog available to us where we can say, you know what, they hold census records for 1850, 18 to 1851, um, 1858 and 1875. Well, if you know that your family came from this village or this town um, in Ukraine, here it tells you that the records for this place are held by the State Archive of Kiev, and it tells me exactly what kind of archives, what year, and what those archive file numbers are. So I can then do a couple of things. I could come into, I could go into Google here, and I could type in State Archive of Kiev and see what comes up. And I can go to their website. And one of the things that I love um, about using Google or Google Chrome is that oftentimes it will even provide me with a translate button if the website is not in, um, in English. And so I can come in here and I can say, here's there's telephone numbers, there's email, um, addresses, they have a specific um, web address that's specific to them, and so I can come here to their specific website. Here I can translate this page, or they have even provided a translator where I can click on it and it will translate things into um, British English anyway. It provides me with maps and information about that location. Here's information about the hours if I want to visit. I can scroll down and I can see the people who work there, the kinds of records that they have. Here they have a description of archive holdings, so I could read and see if there's, there are any other records I'm interested in. So all of this is just provided on their website, but that most important information is going to be this contact information. Specifically in my case, what I'm interested in is this email address. That becomes really useful. Um, so I've checked the online catalog to see what records I'm interested in. And now here is just a really strong piece of advice for you. When you write an archive that you know has records that you're interested in, formulate one specific request. Do not provide a laundry list of, I want every single record you might have for my grandfather and here's his name and birth date. Um, do not request 
four or five information about four or five different families formulate one specific request per email i would re recommend that you start with just sending that one request and see you know see how the process works with this particular archive before you send your next request so don't just send um, one request per email and send multiple emails right away go through the whole process with one request first it helps you understand how the process works with each archive and they're all just a little bit different it also um, you also start to build up a relationship with them so use a translator if necessary so I'm going to use this example with the Ukraine again if I'm going to write them I'm going to write my simple specific request in English and I'll show you that example here and then I'm gonna to go to Google Translate which is a website I use quite a bit and I'm gonna say you know what I want to translate from English into Ukrainian and then I'm gonna paste my request right in here and it will give me the translation of that so when I email my request I will have the the paragraph in English and then directly below that I will have the same paragraph translated in Ukrainian because you don't know if the person on the other end if you're particularly when we're talking about foreign languages you don't know if there's someone there that speaks English or not these translators are not perfect sometimes there's some grammatical issues but but you have shown that you've made the effort and when I have done that I find that they're a lot more likely to respond to my request because I have made the effort to provide them that information in their language as well. If they have not provided you with payment or cost information for, for records, especially where I'm asking for research, right? I'm not asking them to just go and pull a record that I know exists. I'm asking them to actually look at a collection of records that they hold for something specific. So I'm asking them to do research for me. And so offer that payment and then provide both your mailing address and your email address as contact information so that they can get a hold of you or get that information back to you. Sometimes an email address is sufficient. They'll email you back with documents attached and, and that's fantastic. Sometimes some of these smaller archives and repositories they have no way to copy those records other than a copy machine. And so even if you email them the request, they will need to mail you back by snail mail the copies of the documents that they find. They can't scan them or digitize them because they may not have the facilities to do that. So be sure to provide them with both ways to contact you, both a mailing address and an email address. So here is just a simple example of the request that I would write to this archive in Ukraine about how um, about what I want. So I'll read this, it's on your screen, but I will read it to you just so that you get a feeling for it. Uh, according to your website, you hold the census records for Tchaikovsky for 1850 to 1851 and 1858. I am looking for information on anyone with the surname Spectre living there during that time. I expect there are at least three or four families. I am happy to pay for research and copies. Can you provide me with this information? You can reach me by email at or by mail at and then a thank you at the bottom. Now that may seem pretty elementary. It is very basic, it is very simple, but I have provided all the information they need. I have specified the town and the records that I know that they hold, the census for these two years. I've also provided them with the surname that I'm looking for and what I expect them to find um, because I've done my own research. I know that there were three or four families, they're related, but they're three or four separate households that will be living there in that time. They may find more um, and that may be a great surprise for me, but I provided them with what I expect. Um, I've provided this sentence here, this information here that I'm happy to pay for those research and copies. Um, I've made a request, I've provided them with information to contact me, and then I have closed with a thank you. Now they may come back and say, I'm sorry we don't have the staff to do that kind of research. You, here's a list of people that are in the area that you can hire to do that for you. They may come back and say, you know what, um, we couldn't find anything, and sometimes that's true, and sometimes that's just their way to get you to go away. 
Um, they may come back, they may not come back for six months, and when they do, six months later, you may get a packet of information with 30 pages in a brown envelope in the mail. That's always my favorite kind of, of mail. Um, that, you know, because they've done the research, but they just didn't communicate with you that whole six months while you were waiting anxiously and wondering, did they get my email? Did they understand? Are they ever going to respond? Recognize that these archives, again, genealogy is not their priority. They just, it just may take them a while to get to your request. And so six months later, you get the brown envelope in the mail with a little note that they would appreciate a donation of 30 or $40 because of the research that they've done. And here's where you can send that money. And so you send the money and then you send another request um, because now you know how that works. This works for archives, whether they're here in the United States, whether they're um, overseas in a country where they don't speak the language and some of their technology may be lagging behind some of the technology we have here in the United States. It doesn't matter. What matters is that they have the records that we need to be able to continue to grow our family trees. And so the kinder we are to them, the the more patient we are with them, and the more clear we are with them in our requests, the more likely they are to help us and the next person that comes along that's also a genealogist that makes a request of them. You can do this for um, archives and vital records offices, many of whom provide online forms. You can do it with Uh, libraries and archives that hold records that you want them to research for you. One of my most common requests is um, calling up a local library and asking them to check their microfilmed historic newspapers for obituaries back in the 1800s. And very often they'll do that for me for free and I'll have it in my email in 24 or 48 hours. Sometimes they ask me for $10 and it takes you know, three or four months. Either way, it's okay, because I'm getting to the information that I need to be able to document the people in my family tree and to be able to continue to grow that tree and tell those stories. Until next time, this is Krista Cowan. Have fun climbing your family tree.